Tonight on Love and Respect, part two with civil rights icon Andrew Young. Hank Aaron was, was a friend of yours and, and a steward in this community. Um, I miss him. I'm, I'm sure you do too. I can remember Hank Aaron coming to town. I was in the middle of a bunch of good old boys from somewhere and, and they cheered just like everybody else. Yeah. And I realized that the integration of baseball by ja Jackie Robinson uh, was as important as what we were doing. More with Ambassador Andrew Young coming up right now. There was a rabble rouser amongst you guys um, who, who was big on the Atlanta political scene, served on city council. He came to my seventh grade class and spoke to us and was the first person to tell me that Egyptians were Africans. And not Africans by way of it was in Africa, Africans by way of Kush, the people looked like you. Yeah. So don't ever doubt yourself. And his name was Hosea Williams. Right. And he was a hell raiser at times. Well, Jose was an interesting man. Mm -hmm. Jose was born, you know, the, the same blind school for the blind that Ray Charles went to? Yes, sir. His mother and his father were in that school. Both of them were blind. I didn't know that. And they weren't supposed to be getting together, but his mother got pregnant and she hid it, went home to her grandmama on Christmas, over Christmas, had Jose, left him with the grandmama and went back to school. Uh, and um, he was raised by his grandmother and father. Yeah. When you grow up without a mother's love directly, um, you you can you got a right to be kind of crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Hosea was so bitter that he joined the army when he was 16 or 17. He lied about his age and asked him why did he do that. He said because the army was the only place that I could go to legitimately kill white people. <laughs> wow, Jose. And he, he went to uh, Europe underage and was hit in a foxhole he was in. There was a direct bomb hit and everybody got killed in that foxhole. Except him. He was under the bottom. And when they were taking the bodies out, uh, a day later, uh, they found him under there still alive uh, and took him to a hospital in England. After 11 months in the hospital in England, he's coming back to Georgia. And in a hot day in the summer, he tried to get water from a fountain. It said white only, but he went into the store to try to buy a cup. They wouldn't sell him a cup. They sold him, they made him buy a cup of coffee. And he poured it out, because he doesn't drink coffee, rinsed the cup out, and was trying to get, a, get some water. And he's a veteran mm -hmm. on crutches, see, with a purple heart. And um, a bunch of young white kids roughed him up uh, for drink, trying to get a drink of water. And he said he decided then that the Lord was saving him to give his life back here for black folks. <laughs> <laughs> and so he, he had this thing about almost like he, he was looking to, how can I get myself killed? <laughs> Not when he went to Forsyth with Oprah. <laughs> yeah. when, no, but even before, I mean, he was always pushing the an envelope. Agitator. See? Okay. And I... Um, I mean, I, I, I liked him. Yeah. In fact, the only time, I, first time I went to jail uh, was to get him out of jail. There was a person who played an instrumental part in my life and in organizing with you, he was a young man, you met him. His name was James Orange. He was played by Omar Dorsey in the movie Selma. He never called me Killer Mike. He what? called everyone leader. He would only call me, me Michael. And he and Walt Cleveland were the people hands-on taught me. Yeah. Tell us about James, because he's one well, of the more unrecognized figures. Let me tell you something. And he was a huge man, huge yeah. black man. James Orange was about 6'4", mm -hmm. and weighed at least 200. Well, 
He was knocking on the door 300 pounds. Yeah, he's a big guy. Pounds. And if it was today in Alabama, in fact, his, his um, nephew, uh, who was a little younger, mm -hmm. played at Alabama and was the first black coach in the SEC. He coached Mississippi State. Wow. That was James Younger nephew. And, um, but James would have been a great football player because yeah. he, was, he was a good dancer for one thing. Yeah. So he loved dance. And this great big guy with all these fancy dance moves. Uh, but that's the way his spirit was. He called everybody leader. Yeah. He served us well in Birmingham because, see, I'm 5'7". Martin Luther King wasn't but five, six. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't go into these places and demand any respect. James would go in and say, all right, I want everybody to give Dr. Martin Luther King their full attention. Now y'all can drink and cuss and do what you've been doing after. We're not gonna be here long, but right now, I want everything to focus on Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah. Give him a hand, see? Yeah. And that would get the attention of people in the pool halls and the bars. Yes. And Dr. King would talk about nonviolence. And all of you guys seem to have stayed the course in leading nonviolent lifestyles, political lessons. Like when you ran for Congress, of course you get some pushback from people who were more to the black nationalists. You get pushback from people who were generally um, like segregation worked for us at the time. Why do we not want it now in terms of the white audience? Yet your activist past um, didn't prevent you from becoming a congressman, later U.S. ambassador and then mayor. What did being that activist, how did it prepare you for politics? Um, did it prepare you for politics? And what did being a politician teach you? Because once you got to be a politician, you were one of the most pragmatic. You were let, one let, of the ones that... Let me answer it this way. Okay. Later on when I became ambassador to the U.N. Yes, sir. Jimmy Carter gave me a little note saying, I want you to talk to as many African leaders as possible. Yeah and ask them what we might do to help them, see? And don't tell them what we want to do, ask them. And so I, I did. And I had talked to about 26 African leaders uh, traveling around Africa and went to South Africa. And I'd been to South Africa a couple of times already, but I'd never met with the white South Africans, see? And the State Department didn't want me. They said, no, we need you to talk to the African leaders. I said, no, I talk to them all the time. They come to Atlanta, <laughs> see, uh, we're friends. I said, I, I need to, they said, well, why? I said, who's the meanest son of a bitch you got to deal with? <laughs> <laughs> and when I put it that way, they said, P.W. Bota. Okay. I said, well, why can't I talk to him? You had talked to George Wallace? Said, yeah. But they said, well, well, we don't talk to him. Now, these are the white State Department people. Yeah. I said, well, do you have a phone number? And I called him up. How'd that conversation go? Well, that's what I'm saying. The first thing he, when I walked in his office, he said, who are you coming with? How many people coming? I said, well, I can come by myself or I can bring the ambassador. He said, come by yourself. Yes, sir. So I walked, went in. He didn't even say hello. He just grabbed me by my hand, grabbed me by my hand and pulled me in his office and he turned his back on me and walked to his desk. And he said, "Why did white people vote for you?" <laughs> and I said, "What do you mean?" He said, y "You were in Congress. Your district was mostly white. Why did white people vote for you?" I said, "Well, I don't know, but I said you know, I, I've been working with them for years on other things before politics, and I guess they decided that we we're going to have to learn to live together, and they might just well try me out. You helped, in my opinion, Carter um, conquer some things. There's, um, I never knew he was from an 80 percent black county, but in his biography, it speaks to. to Kind of, a lot of times white liberals are quiet when the worst of white people are showing or when the ugliness is out there. They don't know how to pivot or what to do. But it seems like um, former President Carter, when he became governor, got staunch about defending what was right in matters of race and things of that nature. How's your relationship with him evolved? Because he's now revered as Did, one of Do them. you remember Fred Bennett? I don't remember Fred Bennett. 
Fred Bennett was, Fred Bennett, I, I used to say he was Daddy King's outside Joe. Okay, okay. <laughs> because Martin met Fred Bennett, caught him on Auburn Avenue, digging in garbage cans looking for something to eat. Uh, and he was a big guy. Yeah. And Martin and A.D. were small. Mm -hmm. And Martin stopped him and brought him home and for lunch at yeah. his house. And he and Bennett, Bennett was somebody that would give his life for Martin. Absolutely. He was born and raised in Buttermilk Bottom. Uh, and when uh, they tore Buttermilk Bottom, putting 75, 85 through there, he said, I ain't leaving. And he went to the landmark and um, applied for an apartment. <laughs> well, they wouldn't give it to him. And uh, so Carol and Paul Moldauer on my staff, they went the next day and applied for a, 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 an apartment. And they were white, and they gave them the apartment. And then they put Fred Bennett's name on it and threatened to file suit. Yeah. Uh, and he got in the landmark. So, well, uh, there was this Iranian fellow who was Jimmy Carter's friend who lived on the same floor. Yeah. And he got to know Jimmy Carter when he was in the state legislature. And he kept telling me, you got to meet this white boy, Andy. You got to meet this white boy. I said, look, Mark, when we were in Sumter County, uh, that was where Martin and them went to jail in uh, Albany. Yeah. And it was hot day, and then it cooled down and cold at night. When we tried to take them some blankets in jail, uh, Sheriff Fred Chapel yeah. wouldn't let us give them any blankets and turned on the, air, the fan to go. And Martin said that Fred Chapel is the meanest man in the world because everybody got sick. Yeah. You see, when I met first met Jimmy Carter, I said, well, "You're you're from down in South Georgia?" He said, "Yep, Sumter County." And I said, "The only thing I know about Sumter County is Fred Chapel." And he said, "Oh yeah, he's a good friend of mine." <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> so how do you grow to trust somebody who's uh, a good friend? Well, well, with Fred? but he, he because Bennett kept saying, "No, you got to know him." Gotcha. Said so now. The Iranian neighbor had an airplane, gotcha. and he flew Jimmy Carter around in, while his campaign. Gotcha. And before he got to be governor, he said, I just want one, I want you to promise me one thing, that you will put, you will say publicly that the days of segregation are done. And uh, he put that in his first speech. Your friendship is one built on a mutual understanding that violence yeah. is not going to be good for the city or state. Yeah. Your friendship is built on one where you guys had to it, l trust and, and show love and respect in spite of... And then Rita and Samuels. And Rita Samuels. Rita Samuels went into his office and said, Governor Carter, <laughs> I've been all over this place. I ain't seen nobody black on the wall. <laughs> oh, yeah, in the Capitol. <laughs> in the Capitol. <laughs> and we, we had black leaders in Georgia before. And he said, well, Rita, that's one of the mistakes we've made. Yeah. And he said, why don't you form a committee and decide which black folk you want put up in yeah. the Capitol? And she picked Bishop Henry McNeil Turner of the CME Church mm -hmm. and Martin Luther King. Wow. And um, I remember he agreed to put them up, had the pictures painted, and we put it up, and the Klan was marching around outside. Yeah. And I remember, because a bunch of kids. All them kids are white men. They get mad because two white, two black guys. But, but, but some black kids got mad with the, with the Klan marching. Yeah. And they started harassing them. And I, I went out there. I mean, I went up and told them. I said, look, they mar harassed us but we had the right to march. They have the right to march. Yeah. Don't harass them. Be thankful yes. that they're marching peacefully. Yeah. See? Yeah. 
And so it all went off smoothly. I want to ask you about the Braves won the World Series. Well, Hank Aaron was, was a friend of yours and, and a steward in this community. Um, I miss him. I'm, I'm sure you do too. Yeah. I'm sure he was there in spirit. Well, and his wife and my wife were good friends yeah. since they were teenagers yeah. only. And uh, since she was a teenager. Uh, and so we've been very close to the Aarons. I can remember Hank Aaron coming to town. Um, I was standing out in front of the American Hotel on Spring Street. Mm -hmm. And um, I was in the middle of a bunch of good old boys from somewhere. I mean, they were obviously from outside of the city of Atlanta because they all had on overalls. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, I was anxious to see what they were going to do when Hank came by. And they cheered just like everybody else. Yeah. And I realized that the integration of baseball by J Jackie Robinson uh, was as important as what we were doing. Yeah. And Dr. King used to say that it's unfortunate that uh, 11 o'clock Sunday morning is the most segregated hour of the week. Yeah. But by 2 o'clock, everybody's at the ballpark, <laughs> and it's one of the most integrated hours of the week. So I I'm grateful to them. And I, I got upset with them for taking the, the uh, all-Star Game away from Cobb County. I was I was upset as well because Cobb County now has three black women. Yep. And two white women running the county. It's as diverse a county. They, as they, they have a black sheriff. Yep. See, and huge um, black and Latino population yeah. now. Black businesses are thriving but, in Cobb. But that that is about a that's a couple of hundred million dollars of investment. Yes. In that battery. So, okay, pivot to this question. So, when, when that I, happened... Let me just say, Bragg, and, and when he was... I, I, I went out to, to the All-Star game with Mrs. Aaron. Okay. And I was trying to convince the commissioner that he needed to come next year. And he said, no, he had some reasons. But he said, the earliest we could come to back to uh, Atlanta is uh, 2023. Okay. And I... I said, that's too long. And I said, don't worry about it. We just have to win the World Series. <laughs> <laughs> and we did. And he la but he laughed and I laughed. And we won. I, I, I wasn't, I, I mean, we were, we were a 500 baseball team then. Yeah, yeah. What advice would you give young activists? I have told people plot, plan, strategize, organize, and mobilize because I heard Stokely say, you know, on many of his old tapes, we should be in a constant state of organization. What advice do you have for young people that are organizing? And what advice do you have for me, a young organizer you met 31 years well, ago? There's, there's one thing I think I learned in Atlanta that I didn't know. And that is there's more money in the private sector than in the public sector. Yeah. Now, when we ran out, of, when we were trying to build an airport, um, there was no money in Washington. Ronald Reagan had just been elected. And... Um, he wasn't thinking about cities. Yeah. See? So Maynard and I went to uh, Wall Street. And there's endless money on Wall Street. <laughs> there it is. See? And, but there's limited money in Washington. Yeah. So there's, there's no government money in the Atlanta airport. And we probably have, it probably has cost us 23, 20 to 23 billion dollars. But there's no taxpayer money anywhere. No Atlanta taxpayer, see? In fact, we don't even pay taxes to the cities that we're there. It, it's a totally private thing that pays for itself. Now, like well, you brought 40 billion here for the Olympics, 11 billion went directly to the black community, and the only contingency was you couldn't get rich off the well, 40 billion you. But, and, and, in order to see that everybody makes money, we can't. Yeah. And so nobody in my family has ever had a city contract, see, and including me. And even though I've been, well, but I'm proud of you because 
I was telling you that I didn't make but fifty thousand dollars a year. Yeah. As mayor. And but now the garbage work workers make more than that. Yes. The policemen make more than that. Everybody makes more than the mayor made when I was mayor. But I'm glad you didn't tell but, them what I said when you told me that. Yeah, I'm gonna tell them what you said. What you said that that you said I didn't make but four hundred thousand dollars in eight years as mayor. Yeah. And you said, damn. My wife made me turn down a, a gig that paid me almost that much <laughs> because she didn't want me traveling. Yeah. Now, that's a testimony to her yeah. that you, she loves you more than money. Yeah. And if you can find a woman that loves you more than money, you got a happy wife yeah. <laughs> and a happy life. <laughs> and so God has blessed you yes, sir. See, with all kinds of talent, and, but mostly with a good mind and a big heart. Yes, sir. We were not brought here or sold here as slaves. We may have been sent here by God to make this nation be what it ought to be. I can receive that. I can receive I appreciate you. Thank you. I love okay. and respectfully. Thank you for mentoring me mm -hmm. and just being my friend and hero for over 30 years of my life. Okay. Yes, sir. My man. Mm -hmm.